uh, Father McDonald for his words of welcome earlier. My name is Father Peter West. I'm a priest of the Archdiocese of Newark, New Jersey. I currently work with Human Life International, which is the largest international pro-life organization in the world. We have affiliates and associates in over 85 different countries, and we defend the, the church's teachings on life and, and family issues. We seek to build a, a culture of life and defend life in every stage of development from the moment of conception to the moment of, of natural death. And I bring with me today a beautiful icon of Our Lady of Chestahova. Of course, this is not the original icon, which is in a, the town of Chestahova in southern Poland, but it is a, a faithful replica of it, and I bring it as part of an international pilgrimage called From Ocean to Ocean, the Ocean, From Ocean to Ocean Pilgrimage in Defense of Human Life. And uh, she has been through 24 different countries before arriving here into the United States and now in 13 different states. I am, uh, I am not of uh, Polish descent myself, but I have come to have a great appreciation for icons in general and the icon of Our Lady of Czestochowa in particular. And we celebrate today the solemnity of the Epiphany. And Epiphany is a Greek word which means manifestation or showing forth. And in a certain sense, the, the icon is a manifestation of the presence of God. In the East, they see the icon as kind of a, a window into heaven that makes visible the invisible world, the spiritual presence of the, of the person who is portrayed. And this particular icon of Our Lady of Czestochowa has a very rich history. We believe that uh, the original was actually written by St. Luke the Evangelist, the original iconographer. And, and on a cedar table that came from the home of the Holy Family, a table that may have been made by St. Joseph or even Christ himself. It was uh, hidden away in a cave in the year 70 AD when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, uh, but it was rediscovered by uh, St. Helena, uh, the mother of the Emperor Constantine when she came to the Holy Land to retrieve relics such as the relic of, of the true cross. And she brought the icon back to uh, uh, Constantinople. It remained there for 500 years. Her son, the emperor, built a beautiful chapel for her. It was eventually given as a wedding gift to the princess of Ruthenia and kept in a castle in uh, modern-day Ukraine, in a place called Bels, which is uh, near the Polish-Ukrainian uh, border today, and it remained there for hundreds of years uh, before it came under attack of the Muslim Tartars and so it had to be moved uh, further to the west. And as the wagon well, that was uh, carrying the icon came through the tiny village of, of Czestochowa, uh, the horses would move no further. And so the prince saw that as a sign. That's where the icon should remain. And so it has been in the care of the Pauline fathers who came from the nation of Hungary. They were known to be the the holiest monks of, uh, of the time, uh, and they came to care for her, and it, it's been in their care since the year 1382. Many people have asked about uh, the dark coloring of the icon. She is called the Black Madonna, uh, as well as Our Lady of Czestochowa. Well, there are many theories about that. Some say it was the candles burning over the years that turned the icon dark. Others say that she was damaged in a fire. Uh, others say that the, the uh, Blessed Mother being uh, living in the Middle East would have had darker skin to begin with. And others say that it was simply the stylized portraiture of the, of the time. I think it's probably a combination of those, of those factors. Another thing people ask about are the scars on Our Lady's face. And those were made by Hussite soldiers, they came from what is now the Czech Republic, and they were followers of a renegade priest by the name of Jan Hus, 
and they did not believe in the sacred images. They tried to steal her away, and then they tried to uh, destroy her. Uh, legend says, though, that as the soldier lifted his sword again to strike the, the Blessed Mother, that he was struck dead. And so they, they left the icon, and uh, they were able to repair her somewhat, although there have been attempts have been made over the centuries to try to uh, repair those scars on her face, but always seemingly miraculously, they reappear. And it seems that the Blessed Mother wants us to know that she has suffered, and therefore she can identify with a, a suffering people. And so the people of Poland have always seen her as a, uh, a symbol of their, their martyred nation. Now, uh, this particular replica was actually written by uh, Eva Kowalewska, who was the country director of Human Life International in Poland. She's a very talented woman, uh, along with the, uh, the pro-life and pro-family work that she does. She can speak 13 different Eastern European languages. She is fluent in Russian, and she's also a talented artist as, as well. And so she did this in her spare time. She completed it in 2011, and in 2012, it was touched to the original icon of Our Lady of Czestochowa. It was blessed by the Archbishop of Czestochowa in, uh, in Poland, and uh, I was present at that ceremony, uh, and con con celebrated Mass in the Shrine of Jasnogora, which also means Shining Mountain, and an act of entrustment of a civilization of life and love was made into the hands of the, of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, the icon was given as a gift to the Russian pro-life movement. And uh, they had the idea of what they call a peregrination. A peregrination is a pilgrimage with an icon. And this uh, has its roots in the Old Testament when uh, the, uh, uh, the Jews would bring the Ark of the Covenant into battle with them. And when they were faithful to the Lord that they, and they had the Ark with them, they were able to win victory over, over their enemies. Uh, so also, we are bringing the, the Blessed Virgin Mary into the fight uh, for the culture of, of life. We see in our Gospel today that the, the dramatic clash between the culture of life versus the, the culture of death, as Herod uh, sought to find out where the child Jesus was to be born, not to do him homage, as he's told the, the three kings, but in order to kill him because he saw him as a rival. Now, there's a historical record that uh, Herod was so brutal that he even uh, killed three of his sons because he thought that they were plotting against him, which caused Caesar to say that he'd rather be Herod's dog than his son. So he was, he was a brutal man, and we can see that, that uh, it would have been very uh, uh, appropriate or fitting for him uh, to have killed the, the, the holy innocents in the place of, of Christ, seeking to, to uh, eliminate a, a rival. But this, uh, this icon we bring forth, and now uh, it, it, it was given as a gift to the, the uh, uh, Russian pro-life movement. They had the idea of the peregrination, and they, they had the idea of bringing it from the uh, Pacific coast of Russia all the way to the Atlantic coast of, of Portugal, and that is what they did. And they, do, they took the icon to Vladivostok, which is on the Pacific coast of Russia, near North Korea. And Russia has eight different time zones. They took her across Siberia, where there's hardly any roads at all. And they, they took her to, to Moscow. She went to Belarus, uh, Ukraine, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovak Republic, uh, Hungary, Romania, uh, Croatia, Slovenia, uh, Italy, uh, Austria, Liechtenstein, Switzerland, Germany, France, Belgium, Great Britain, Ireland, where most of my ancestors came from, 
and then to, to Spain, to Portugal, uh, and, and now here to, to the United States. And all along the way, prayers have been offered for the defense of life. When she was in Russia, uh, the women some would come up to the icon and spontaneously confess sins of past abortions. We know that is a great problem there in, in Russia where the average woman has uh, seven to eight abortions during the course of her, her lifetime. We know that alcohol is a big problem uh, not, uh, in, the, in Russia and also here in the United States. And is a destroyer of families and people were making pledges to, to swear off alcohol. They were uh, so returning to the church, returning to, to faith. And, and here in the United States also, I took her to a place uh, on the feast of Our Lady of Chestahova, which is August 26th, a place where they do late-term abortions. We were outside on a Monday morning praying the rosary and uh, with about 75 people and singing hymns. And three women changed their mind that day and decided not to go through with, with planned abortions. Just recently had her in uh, uh, the Cathedral of St. Joseph in Manchester, New Hampshire, and also at a Ukrainian Catholic church in Manchester. And we had a procession uh, to uh, Planned Parenthood where they were doing abortions. And uh, as we reached the, uh, the Planned Parenthood, uh, and we were walking almost a mile in eight degree temperatures, and praying the rosary along the way and singing hymns, as we reached the Planned Parenthood, there was a woman coming out of the parking lot, and she had a big smile on her face, and she had decided to keep her baby, to choose life for her child. And I see this as fruit of prayers to Our Lady of, of Chestahova. We celebrate the Feast of the Epiphany, the manifestation of the Lord. Pope John Paul II said that every human life is a manifestation of God in the world, a sign of His presence and a trace of His glory. By taking on our human nature in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Christ gave new value to each and every human life that is made in His image and likeness. And while the icon may not always strike us as particularly beautiful, yet it reveals an inner beauty. And St. Ambrose said of our feast today, but what was it that moved the Magi to adore him? The Virgin bore upon her no distinguishing mark, and the abode was not one of splendor. For of the things that fell upon their outward senses, there was nothing striking. There was only a manger, a mud hut, a poor mother. And so also, we cannot judge by appearances of a human being. Our Lord tells us that whatever we do to the least of our brothers and sisters, that we do unto Him. And just so every human being is made in the image and likeness of God and must be treated with, with dignity and respect in spite of their appearances, their size, their stage of development, whether in or, or outside of, of the womb. Pope Francis said that every unborn child, though unjustly condemned to be aborted, has the face of Christ, who even before his birth, and as soon as he was born, experienced the rejection of the world. You know, we have this icon has been all through Russia, and for many years we prayed for for Russia, uh, following the uh, prophecies of Our, Our Lady of, of Fatima, who said that Russia would spread her errors all over the world. And Russia uh, was uh, established an atheistic state in 1917, and Russia was the first country to legalize abortion. But now we need to pray for the United States of America. Blessed Pope John Paul II said something I think is prophetic about the right to life in America when he said this, that every human being, no matter how vulnerable or helpless, no matter how young or how old, no matter how healthy, handicapped or sick, no matter how useful or productive for society, 
is a being of inestimable worth, created in the image and likeness of God. And he said, this was the dignity of America, the reason that we exist, the condition for our very survival, and the ultimate test of our greatness, to respect every human being, especially the weakest and the most defenseless ones that are born. But let's face it, America has not heeded those prophetic words which were uttered in 1987 in Detroit, a city which is now bankrupt. And you can wait an average of 57 minutes for someone to respond to your 911 call in, in Detroit. So if you have had a heart attack or a victim of a violent crime or have had a serious accident, it could mean life and death. 50, those 57 minutes you wait for, for help. But I don't believe the situation is hopeless. And I believe that Our Lady of Chestnahova presents to us an opportunity. We, uh, we need to call on Our Lady. We need to ask for her intercession, just as she interceded at the wedding feast of Cana. And uh, Christ worked his first miracle. He had no intention of working that miracle. He said to her, Woman, how does this concern of yours involve me? My hour has not yet come. But yet, what does Mary say? Do whatever he tells you. And so Mary worked that miracle even though Christ had no intention to do so, but he did so because his mother asked him to do it. So that's the power of the mother's prayers. That's the power of Mary's prayers. We ask her, and she wants us, she wants the, to, uh, the culture of life more than we, than we do. But certain uh, prayers, now, certain intentions are only ans ask, answered if we ask for them. So we need to pray. And you know, over the years, there have been great victories worked through the, the intercession of Our Lady of Chester Hall. But I'll just recount one. And that would happen in 1979 when uh, the people of Poland gathered because the communist government was not allowing Pope John Paul II to visit Poland, uh, except under very heavy restrictions. Well, they went to, to the shrine, they prayed for seven days, they called it the Siege of Jericho. After those seven days of prayer, the communist government inexplicably dropped its heavy restrictions on the Pope's visit. The Pope came the next month, he strengthened the solidarity movement, that led to a chain of events that eventually led to the fall of the communist government in Poland, throughout Eastern Europe, and even the atheistic Soviet Union itself. And now the churches that have been destroyed in Russia are being rebuilt. Churches that were used as museums of atheism are, are being restored as churches. We had this beautiful uh, pilgrimage with the icon through Russia. All of this would have been impossible in former Soviet times. So we know if Our Lady can work such a great victory over atheistic communism in Poland and Eastern Europe and including Russia, then she can also help us here in the United States to build a culture of life. So I hope that you will join with me and Human Life International in praying for the success of the From Ocean to Ocean Pilgrimage of Defense of Life Please come up after Mass, take one of these holy cards, uh, touch it to the icon, uh, and keep it as a remembrance of the visit of Our Lady here today. Pray for your personal intentions, pray for your family, but pl please pray for a greater respect for life, that we can build together a new culture of life and civilization of love in which each and every human being will be welcomed, protected, nurtured, and loved from the moment of conception to the moment of natural death and that every family will be a sanctuary of life and of love.